Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Cancer Immunotherapy Exploring Imaging as a Catalyst to Immune Response Prediction. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point in time, I'd like to thank KeyBIM, who developed the content for this presentation. At KeyBIM, they're revolutionizing personalized medicine by delving beyond what the human eye can see. They employ AI-powered imaging tools derived from years of intensive research to assist doctors in diagnosis and anticipating patient progression. Their solutions transform imaging data into actionable predictions, enhancing patient outcomes, and driving medical imaging innovation. Now internationally expanded, KeyBIM is excited to introduce their new line of products focused on predictive imaging biomarker panels, ensuring continuous advancement in life sciences and provider solutions. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. And first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Michael Ferris. And there he is, Associate Director of Operations at Imagine Ab um, Lo in Europe uh, Limited. Dr. Ferris assists Imagine Ab's clinical development programs, specializing in integrating CDA immunopet into partnered clinical studies, primarily focusing on oncology. So thank you very much, Michael. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Glenn Wise, Chief Medical Officer at KeyBIM. Dr. Wise is an expert in clinical investigation, translational research, and medical oncology, with a career spanning over 100 phase one through three oncology studies and numerous biomarker translational research studies. So thank you very much, Dr. Wise. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Anna Jimenez Pastor, holding degrees in telecommunication, hi, and biomedical engineering from the Polytechnical University of Valencia in Spain, currently serves as a VP of AI at KeyBem. She leads the development of innovative AI solutions applied to medical imaging. Now, it's my pleasure to pass the mic over to our first speaker and the controls to our first speaker, and that is Michael. So, Michael, when you're ready, you may begin. Thank you, Sonia, for the introduction. And I'd also like to thank Quibim for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate. I'm gonna be talking today about visualizing the immune response with, response with CD8 Immunopet. First of all, a little about Imaginab. So we're a biotech located in, uh, with headquarters in LA, but with a small office in the UK, which is where I work. We have a proprietary mini body and cyst dia body platform for rapid to clinic development of new radio pharmaceuticals comprised of antibody fragments. Five products have been advanced to the clinic to date, including CD8 and PSMA targeted ligands. And we also have a focus on radio pharmaceutical therapies. And within our, our current RPT pipeline, we have targets for alpha V beta six and DLL3. But Imaginab's lead product is the Conium 89 Crefmalumab Bidoxam, which is a radio labeled mini body for PET imaging of CD8 cells. And this is the, uh, the product that I'm gonna be talking about today. Here's a schematic of the, uh, the PET agent. So Crefmalumab is the mini body itself, which is approximately 80 kilodaltons, uh, which is roughly half the size of a full length antibody. Bidoxam or deferoxamine is the chelator, which is used in the radiolabeling process. And here for this product, we radiolabel with zirconium 89. 
Uh, zirconium-89 has a half-life of 3.2 days, which is well suited uh, for the imaging of mini bodies. So the product has a shelf life of six days. It's immunologically inert, has a high affinity for CD8 alpha, fast blood clearance, and a high signal to noise ratio. On the right hand side of the screen here, you can see a direct comparison of F18 and FDG PET and zirconium 89 CD8 PET in the same patient. So you can immediately see there's, there's some very different uptake patterns here. And with CD8 immunopets, we see uptake in the, uh, the, the lymphoid organs, so high uptake in the spleen. We see uptake in the bone marrow, uh, in the lymph nodes, and also um, we see uptake in the liver, which is the organ uh, where this agent is cleared from primarily. The longer half-life of zirconium-89 allows us to image out over several days. So this is an example from our phase one study where a patient was imaged uh, on day one, one hour after infusion. And then we performed repeat imaging on day two, day three, and day six. You can see here the tumors which are located in the liver and indicated by the green arrows were visible across the whole series as were the, the spleen and bone marrow. Uh, you can see that the, the bone marrow had the highest uptake on day one and then tailed off out towards day, day six. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the, the lymph node here in the neck indicated by the red arrow, uh, it wasn't visible uh, one hour after infusion, but it became visible from day two onwards. So for this reason, we generally image on the day after infusion. So why are CD8 cells a good target for PET-CT imaging? I'd just like to highlight a few uh, articles that summarize some important results. First of all, uh, the cancer immunity cycle, uh, this was first published in 2013 by Chen et al. And um, it really identified CD8 positive T cells as the, the primary effector cells in the anti-tumor immune response. So uh, the CD8 cells, uh, they recognize cancer associated antigens and uh, they're responsible for tumor cell death by apoptosis by the release of uh, perforin and granzyme B. And we've seen in other studies that CD8 cells are the most prognostic uh, of all um, immune infiltrates within the tumor uh, across a majority of cancers. And in a recent meta-analysis uh, published in 2021, um, which looks specifically at CD8 positive cells, uh, T cells, um, the conclusion was that CD8 cells from the tumor, uh, the stroma and the invasive margin were a predictive of outcome in patients uh, receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors, but uh, not uh, circulating CD8 T cells. So it was the tumor infil infiltrating cells that were the most important for predicting outcome. Why is this important? Well, if we look at last year, uh, 2022, there were over 1.5 million patients that were potentially eligible to receive checkpoint inhibitors. Um, of these, the cancer types were uh, most patients that prescribed these agents were non small cell lung cancer. Uh, melanoma and renal cell carcinoma. But unfortunately, uh, despite the rapid growth of these agents uh, and the, the worldwide use, it's still a majority of patients who are unfortunately not responding. Um, and depending on the cancer type, it's somewhere between 10 and 30% who have uh, a durable response and the majority of patients between 70 and 90, depending on the setting, who don't respond at all. Uh, but they do, of course, still suffer the immune related adverse events that are associated with these agents. So there is um, a current need within immuno oncology to better understand the mechanism, mechanism of action of immune checkpoint inhibitors um, and other novel immunotherapies that are coming through so that we're better able to predict which patients are going to respond uh, in order to guide interve interventions, step up and step down treatment where needed. 
uh, manage toxicities and make go no no go decisions. Currently, there are a few markers which appear in immunotherapy approvals, uh, including PDL1 testing, tumor mutational burden, and microsatellite instability or DNA mismatch repair. Um, in some cancer types, these tests have been used to identify populations uh, in which the objective response rate is, uh, is improved for some checkpoint inhibitors. However, a common theme with these tests is that they all rely on biopsy. And we know that biopsy is inherently limited by the fact that you're removing a very small sample from a tumor, which is often a few centimeters across. Uh, so it's a microscopic view. It's an invasive procedure, difficult to repeat, particularly in the same lesion. So there is a high failure rate. Uh, CD8 immunopet, on the other hand, is a whole body view. Uh, it's non-invasive, repeatable, and we're able to detect interpatient, uh, intrapatient and intralesion heterogeneity. So our challenge now is to generate data in clinical trials, which shows that CD8 immunopet uh, is useful in the clinic. And we have a, a clinical development program which is well underway. Our phase one study in 15 patients um, was used to determine which dose to administer. A phase 2A study, which completed last year, uh, looked at the correlation of PET signal with CD8 cell density obtained from immunohistochemistry performed on biopsy samples. And as an exploratory endpoint, there was correlation with response. And the results of this study were presented last year at CITC and there have also been some independent analyses presented this year at AACR and ASCO. Uh, we have an ongoing phase 2b study with the primary endpoint looking at prediction response in patients with solid tumors uh, who are receiving standard of care immunotherapies and we also have a test retest repeatability study that's currently enrolling in the UK. So here's an example of some CD8 immunopet imaging from a, a renal cell carcinoma patient that partook in our phase 2A study. And I've chosen this patient as an example uh, where we see lots of uh, heterogeneity in the different types of CD8 uptake we see in different lesions. So you see that there were several lesions detected uh, ranging from very hot focal uptake uh, through moderate uptake all the way through quite cold or even heterogeneous uptake. And of particular importance, you see the lesion on the right-hand side in the blue box was quite heterogeneous with an area of focal uptake, but also with uh, an area of cold uptake as well. And in the, the box underneath, you can see that the IHC staining there was, uh, was quite devoid of any CD8 cells. So it seems that it was a cold area that was targeted for biopsy. Here's a case study, again, from our phase 2A study. It was a melanoma patient, and we saw uh, a baseline before the initiation of immunotherapy. There was moderate uptake in the lesion, which in this case was in the lower leg, uh, and it was largely around the stroma. And then we imaged again with CD8 immunopet uh, one month later after the initiation of immunotherapy with anti-PD-1 treatment. And we saw a doubling in the SUV max, and it was apparent that, um, that there was a real early and rapid response in terms of the CD8 cells accumulated there in the lesion. So this is an indicator that the patient's having a strong early response uh, and suggestive that, the, that they would ultimately be a responder to treatment. And indeed, uh, four months later, we'd seen a, a reduction in size of 35% in that lesion on the follow-up CT images. I mentioned that there was an independent analysis 
presented at ASCO this year, and this was a subgroup analysis looking at renal cell carcinoma patients uh, from the phase 2A study. And um, what this work found is that when you look at the average SUV max uh, at baseline across not only the tumor, but also the, the pet avid lymph nodes, then um, the, the patients who would ultimately respond to treatment had a, a significantly higher average SUV max on CD8 pair at baseline compared to those patients who would go on to uh, progress or remain stable. So there's further work uh, ongoing at the moment to see if this um, holds up when just looking at the lymph nodes. There was another independent analysis that was presented uh, at AACR this year. And for this work, all of the uh, all of the patients from our phase 2A study, the images were reread and contoured on the CT. And there was a, a patient level aggregate scoring system used based on a change in volume between the baseline and the on-treatment CD8 PET, which is approximately one month after the start of treatment, uh, and also the change in the CD8 infiltrate in the lesions. So the patient level score, score was based on the individual scores from all the lesions within that patient. Uh, looking at graph A here on the left-hand side, this is an example of the kind of heterogeneity of response you can see in a single patient who has multiple lesions. So there, there's five lesions here and they all responded at different times and uh, we had one that progressed and one that remained stable. But when you take the patient level aggregate score, taking all lesions into account, uh, you can see in, in the second graph here that again, you can start to uh, stratify patients based on their assist 1.1 response. So patients with a, a negative score here tended to have a, a better response uh, and patients with a positive score tended to have a worse response. And we, th we I think that uh, by applying this uh, same scoring system to populations uh, with a, a less heterogeneous in terms of cancer types and treatment types, that uh, we have a good chance at uh, predicting which patients are going to be responders and which are non-responders. Here is an example of uh, early detection of a developing immune-related adverse event. So this is a, a case report from our ongoing phase 2B study in which there was a melanoma patient who was treated with dual agent immunotherapy, uh, IPI and NEVO. And after two courses of treatment, the patient started to develop clinical symptoms of hyperphysitis uh, or inflammation of the pituitary gland. So when the investigator went back to look at the CD8 immunopet images, what he found is that um, there was a difference in uptake between the baseline scan and the on-treatment scan in week six. Uh, and so this increase in uptake from baseline to week six was, an, uh, we think, was a, um, a signal picked up on the PET scan that there was a developing adverse event there. And actually, the, the timing of the week six scan was over a week before the patient developed any clinical symptoms. So there is potential for the CD8 immunopet to be able to uh, detect these kind of events very early and potentially to guide the management of these patients. Here um, you can see all the different applications that are currently being explored for CD8 immunopets in our uh, program of investigator initiated trials, which we currently support. I'm not going to go through uh, all of these individually, but uh, just to point out that CD8 immunopet is being explored in, in a wide variety of uh, both oncology and non oncology indications. So we're, we're generating a lot of data at the moment. And we also have uh, increased adoption by pharma and biotech companies who um, 
are interested in using CD8 immunopats in their trials to investigate novel treatments. So um, you can see here that, that there's a whole variety of different uh, and novel immunotherapies which are being explored with CD8 immunopats. And so there's a number of reasons why this will be implemented in a trial, um, including to explore the mechanism of action, uh, to, to look at the pharmacodynamics of the, the novel immunotherapy, and perhaps to also select treat patients who are best suited for clinical trials. So in summary then, uh, CD8 immunopet provides full body imaging of CD8 positive cells. It provides the ability to categorize lesions uh, by the CD8 uptake pattern. And we find all different types of CD8 phenotypes across different lesions in different patients. Uh, it provides the ability to detect dynamic changes in CD8 cell status with repeat imaging before and after the start of immunotherapy treatment. It provides the potential to predict lesion and patient response to immunotherapy, the ability to detect developing immune-related adverse events early. It's a useful tool when investigating novel immunotherapies, and it also provides the potential to aid decision-making in the oncology treatment pathway, which is uh, where we think we're heading with our current clinical trials. So lastly, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, all our patients who've partaken in our trials, uh, all our investigators and research staff, all our pharma partners, uh, and also my colleagues at ImagineAB. And uh, now I'll hand over for the second speaker. Hi, um, I'm Glenn Weiss, Chief Medical Officer of Quibum and I'm gonna be presenting uh, my talk on the current state of cancer immunotherapy theranostics. So learning objectives from my talk, we're gonna give you a brief um, oncology biomarker history overview, and we're gonna discuss where would biomarkers play a role in immuno-oncology, going to touch upon the use of PD-L1, um, tumor mutation burden, uh, microsatellite instability, and mismatch repair, as well as other novel biomarkers, and some of the limitations and opportunities in those respective areas. So the first pathology biomarkers in oncology were uh, primarily in breast cancer with estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 positivity. Uh, this goes back to 1977, where hormone receptor positive tumors, ER and PR, were found to be predictive of breast cancer recurrence, and this triggered the development of uh, ER and PR assays. In 1977, after the initial FDA approval of tamoxifen, which is a selective estrogen receptor modifier, or CIRM, in advanced breast cancer, and then by 1986, uh, tamoxifen gained FDA approval as a breast cancer risk reduction in postmenopausal women. In 1982 to, to 84, there was a lot of work on the characterization of HER2, uh, its identification, and then also its use in categorizing breast cancer. And ultimately, this led to the, the third main um, category of breast cancer um, uh, biomarker, either patients were HER2 positive or HER2 negative. And in 1998, trastuzumab was an anti-HER2 monoclonal antibody that was approved for uh, women with, uh, with HER2 positive breast cancer. And from there, uh, there's been subsequent development and use of other uh, oncogenes and biomarkers for, uh, for treatment selection and stratification, uh, namely in, in solid tumors, uh, the emergence of EGFR mutation testing and ALK translocation testing in non-small cell lung cancer. And then subsequent to that, there are numerous other biomarkers that are linked to therapies that are currently in clinical use.
for the current state of cancer immunotherapy, Theranostics. Uh, there are several biomarkers that are in use, both in tissue and in blood. The most commonly used biomarker is PDL1, and assessing PDL1 expression in patient tumor. As you heard in the past talk, there are some issues with uh, availability of tissue and that it's a representative sample, but not um, all inclusive, and there can be heterogeneity amongst the patient. Uh, for many cancer types, PDL1 expression is kind of the gatekeeper determination of whether or not a patient is a potential candidate, at least for single agent uh, PD, anti PD1 or PDL1 therapy. In addition, uh, there's been a lot of utility and uptake of uh, tumor mutation burden as a tumor agnostic uh, biomarker that uh, has recently gained FDA approval for pembrolizumab when a patient's tumor has 10 mutations per megabase pair. And with a lot of different uh, next-gen sequencing assay platforms, while they're not doing uh, entire genome sequencing, they do a representative um, uh, number of uh, genes that are sequenced. Uh, in one example, an assay sequences about one megabase pair of DNA, and then there is a score translated, and if the patient has uh, 10 mutations or more in that representative sample, uh, that, that correlates to someone being considered uh, having a high tumor mutation burden and may be eligible for uh, pembrolizumab in that indication. And that's in addition or uh, uh, irrespective of PDL1 expression. Another biomarker that is used, uh, although occurs in, in lower frequency, uh, depending on the tumor type, is microsatellite instability or MSI. And so if there's high MSI or there is a mismatch repair deficiency, patients may also be eligible for um, drugs such as uh, pembrolizumab. And so this indication is uh, tumor agnostic as well for patients with MSI high and MMR deficient cancer. Um, however, there is uh, an opportunity here and room for improvement to better uh, develop or, um, I guess, identify patients that are most likely to benefit. Because even with, for example, PD1, PDL1 expression in patients' tumors, this doesn't predict um, anywhere near uh, the majority or supermajority of patients that are likely to benefit from this drug. It's, it's a smaller uh, fraction, as mentioned earlier, between 10 to 30 percent for single agent uh, have a, a response or durable response. And so the aim is to improve on this theranostic. When we're looking at uh, immuno-oncology biomarkers in melanoma, there are many examples um, and a uh, variety of different uh, biomarkers that have been looked at. Most are considered investigational use. And besides tumor mutation burden, neoantigen load, HLA-1 genotyping, aneuploidy, T cell repertoire, uh, there's also PDL1 and LAG3 expression, uh, TCR signature, and circulating tumor DNA profiles that have been reported. Uh, however, there's a lack of consensus uh, for a validated biomarker in this population. So there's an opportunity there in melanoma. For renal cell carcinoma, PDL1 expression uh, can have a role as a predictive biomarker, but its use in this disease is also limited. Uh, VHL alterations have also been explored for IO benefit, and uh, that biomarker is also considered investigational. So here, too, there is a lack of consensus of a validated bar biomarker for this population. For immuno-oncology biomarkers in breast cancer, uh, one should be aware that pd one positivity in uh, one subtype of breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, can vary between 17 to 59 percent, and it may be observed on uh, to be expressed on either tumor cells or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, leading to different assay cutoffs and standards. So, for instance, one problem is there are at least four FDA registered PDL1 IHC assays, and these employ different PDL1 antibodies that are listed here on the slide. Uh, these are implemented on two different IHC platforms, either the DACO or the Vantana, and have, as a result, four different scoring systems, depending on um, which company was developing this IHC assay as a companion diagnostic. 
and there are a number of technical hurdles and um, one because numerous laboratories have different uh, cutoffs and variability uh, and there is some specialized training required to try and minimize the variability amongst uh, pathologists using these different scoring systems antibodies and platforms so in the table inset below on the slide you can see just uh, an example on different cutoffs based on the uh, clone used and then the criteria <clears throat> and then the linked um, pdl uh, one PD, PD-1 antibody that's associated with those uh, biomarkers. A note for at least one of those that that drug is uh, has been withdrawn for that for breast cancer in particular, but remains on the NCCN guidelines as an option. So here there's an opportunity uh, such that we can reduce the subjectivity with radiomics and hopefully identify a potential universal imaging classifier for what would be considered a patient that is PDL1 positive. When we're looking at IO biomarkers in non-small cell lung cancer, besides again the issue of small sample and, and exhausting sample, we have uh, tumor heterogeneity and sample quality. Um, also again diverse uh, staining protocols with different cutoffs and for uh, tumor mutation burden, there's also a variability on the cutoff and input for each platform that is used and the lack of uh, overall survival correlation with the uh, tumor mutation burden. There was a study conducted by the uh, International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer called the Blueprint uh, PDL1 IHC assay comparison project. You can see from the graphic here looking at biopsy samples, aspirations, and also surgically resected sample, there is um, pretty similar results across the IHCs for the different types of sample. Uh, one of the clones in general, the SP142, tends to stain fewer tumor cells. That's the uh, green line on each one of those blocks. And the 7310 stain uh, stains more tumor cells to variable degrees across the different samples. So um, here again, there's an opportunity where we can reduce the subjectivity of scoring with radiomics and hopefully identify a potential for universal imaging classifier. And most of the work thus far has been focused on using PDL1, TMB, MSI, high and uh, DNA mismatch repair for single agent uh, immune checkpoint PDL1 or anti uh, sorry anti PDL1 or anti PD1 drugs. However, in practice now uh, and with FDA approval, there are uh, many indications where now these immune checkpoint inhibitors are combined with uh, chemotherapy or they're combined with another immune checkpoint inhibitor like a CTLA-4. So in this example, I wanted to show you the difference in the um, PDL1 scoring, the, which uh, for this drug, pembrolizumab, uh, tumor proportion scoring uh, is used. And this comes from studies in both non-squamous and squamous uh, non-small cell lung cancer, where the if we look at the top bracket for a tumor proportion score of greater than or equal to 50%, you can see a nice divergence of curves between a survival benefit for the pembrolizumab combination versus just chemotherapy by itself. And that also holds true in panel D on the bottom left for a tumor proportion score less than 1%. So that's a very low uh, PDL1 expression, almost uh, not visible on the on the tumor block. And also you see the benefit of the combination of Pembro with chemo versus chemo alone. When you get to progression-free survival in the next column, uh, also there is a significant difference between the Pembro plus chemo versus chemo alone. However, it's more um, uh, divergent with the combination uh, and TPS greater than 50% for the non-squamous uh, histologies. When you move to now the middle panel and the uh, far uh, right panel, 
you'll see that for overall survival, the degree of difference is a little bit smaller and it's not significant when the TPS score is less than 1% for overall survival. Uh, for PFS, uh, the first panel B is greater than 1% and then there's a typo, I think, in the publication where uh, panel E is less than 1%, um, you, you still see some significant differences. So there remains uh, a need to have a validated biomarker, especially for combination therapy, where um, when someone or someone's tumor has low degree of, uh, of PD-L1 positivity, uh, there may be lack of benefit or harder to determine who's getting benefit from the combination of, uh, in this instance, chemotherapy along with uh, anti-PD-1 or pembrolizumab. So to summarize uh, what I've shown you so far, are some of the limitations of the current uh, immuno-oncology biomarkers. In general, pdl one IHC expression uh, varies from uh, uh, biopsy technique, location, antibody, and assay type. For several cancer types, um, pdl one can have minimal clinical value. TMB has significant room for improvement. Uh, and MSI high MMR deficient is a relatively small proportion of cancer patients overall. Where there are opportunities, there is still no good uh, biomarker for uh, immunotherapy or for combination uh, therapy when there is a need for a validated biomarker. Uh, and there's still where PDL1 plays a role in helping determining which uh, therapy is appropriate, there's still a need for uniformity or the conversion between systems to make them comparable. So something like a uniform uh, biomarker that, that accounts for the differences in uh, cutoffs and things like that, such that radiomics might fit that need. And with that, I thank you and I'll hand off my talk to Anna. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Glenn. So this last session uh, will be about the use of radiomics and AI, so the present um, and, the, and the future. Oh, sorry, these are the, the learning objectives of the of the session. So it will be to understand the fundamental principles of radiomics and its application in medical imaging, to explore the integration of AI techniques in radiomics analysis for the immunotherapy response predictions, to examine the clinical applications that we can have with radiomics and AI, and to identify the future prospects and direction of the field of radiomics in AI for immunotherapy response prediction. So if, if we take a look to the, um, we can see to the patient journey, now we can see that uh, while well, the patient uh, along the journey from the disease, it's uh, diagnosed uh, until an event happen, different events uh, occur in the, in the process. Uh, usually these, these patients at diagnosis, uh, uh, a biopsy is available. So this is uh, in most of the patients, we will find it um, uh, in order to make the, the diagnosis and uh, to stage no, and to uh, stratify the patient accordingly. However, if we go through the journey of the patient, uh, this technique becomes difficult not to be done at different time points. And this is where imagine uh, can be converted you know, and, and to the standard of care in order to analyze the, um, the response to the treatment in these type of patients. No? So thanks to imaging, we can monitor the progression or the, uh, how the, the disease evolved uh, during the time. So if we focus on different uh, time points, uh, we start with the diagnosis of the patient and then we start the treatment and then we can have different follow-ups. So thanks to AI, how we can help in this process. So the first process no, in which AI can help us is the, in the treatment uh, evaluation. So we can develop AI models for automatic lesion detection and the tracking of the lesions in order to analyze the response to a treatment and automate processes such as the uh, assessment of the resist. 
So how can we do that? So we can use uh, automatic segmentation uh, algorithms. So deep learning and specific convolutional neural networks have shown uh, really good results in this task. So we can train uh, AI models in order to automate the lesion detection and segmentation. So this means we can automate the contouring of the lesion um, in a specific time point. Um, we can develop models not only focused on a specific organ, for example, uh, lung lesions, but we can build models to uh, segment uh, lesions in an organ ag agnostic way. So we can try using whole body CT scans, for, insta for instance, we can train uh, AI models in order to detect all the lesions that are visible um, in the scan. So not only the primary tumor, but also the metastasis. So we can develop this kind of organ agnostic models. However, uh, as we know, now we need to perform the segmentation not only in one time point, so we need to segment the lesion at different time points. So for that, we can also uh, develop algorithms in order to track the lesions along the time. So in order to be able to identify the lesion on the different time points and on the different CT scans that we have performed to the patient. So for that, we can develop algorithms in order first to segment the lesion the, at, its, at its time point, then to track the lesion across the different time point, then to calculate automatically both the long and short axis, and then to automate the calculation of the response to treatment according to the RESIS 1.1 guidelines or iRESIS guidelines. So this process can be automated uh, thanks to AI, and we can develop uh, tools in order to um, uh, enhance no, and, and automate this process in the clinical routine. Um, however, uh, the patient not only has this kind of, uh, of uh, time points, no? so we do not only want to analyze what is today happening to the patient. No? We have different time points and we want to, what we want to do as well is to know what is going to happen uh, with the patient in the future. So for that, we can develop AI models for patient's characterization and stratification through the prediction of different clinical endpoints. And for that, uh, we can use uh, what we call the radiomics pipeline. No? So the, the radiomics pipeline is a process of different steps in which we can end up building a predictive model, for example, for the prediction of the patient overall survival, the prediction of the patient response to the treatment, the prediction of the patient even free survival. No? So we can analyze different time points. So the first process that we do is usually the identification and the segmentation of the lesion. And for that, we use the same tools that we have seen before for the segmentation of the lesion for the evaluation of the response to the treatment. So first, we identify and segment uh, the lesion in, in the scan. Then the next step is to characterize uh, the lesion that, we, uh, that is of interest. No? So for that, we can uh, apply um, algorithms in order to extract features from, from the lesion. So in this way, we characterize the, the lesion using, on one hand, we can use uh, traditional radiomic features. So these are features related with, for example, the shape of the tumor, how the intensities are, uh, of the tumor are. So this is to, to analyze if the, um, uh, the heterogeneity of the lesion. So we can extract a lot of information uh, from the lesion. In this way, we can extract more than 1,000 radiomic features. But not only radiomic features, we can also take advantage of deep learning and what we call the deep features. So we can take advantage of deep learning, the knowledge that we have of the different uh, knowledge that the convolutional neural network can obtain when we train it with medical imaging in order to extract these deep features. No? So all these features can be combined to create a data set with thousands of features to characterize uh, the patient. However, when we are uh, working with uh, multi-institutional uh, data sets, so this is data coming from different institutions, acquired at different scanners with different decision protocols, we find variabilities, no? what is called the batch effect. So we find these variabilities 
that we want to we need to minimize uh, before building an AI model in order to avoid this kind of biases um, in our models. So for that, we can use uh, harmonization techniques in order to differentiate, uh, to minimize this, this difference. For example, in this image, we can see uh, a radiomic feature, uh, the distribution across different manufacturers. So for example, GE, uh, uh, Canon, Siemens, Philips, etc. So we can find the variabilities that this radiomic feature has across the different manufacturers and how these variabilities are minimized once we apply these harmonization techniques. So this is very important when we deal with this kind of data sets acquired at different institutions. Um, so at the last point, uh, we have already built our data set. So we go to the creation of the predictive models. So let me, to explain this, this step, let me go to, the, to a case study that, that we have uh, developed uh, at KBIM. So um, uh, this study was a failed phase three clinical trial where um, the, the main target was the non-small cell lung cancer patients with high expression of pdl one However, in a subset of patients, uh, uh, it was found that um, these patients suffered an early progression. So in this way, what we wanted to do is to analyze if with imaging, we were able to characterize and to detect these patients that are going to progress earlier. No? So uh, with this goal in, in, in mind, we build this pipeline and we analyze all the imaging studies uh, of the clinical trial and we build predictive models in order to help in the design of future clinical trials. So um, in this sense, um, we can take advantage of the advantages you know, that uh, imaging uh, uh, offers us. So one is, what is the main advantage? The main advantage is the, the possibility to analyze uh, the whole patient. You know? So we can extract information from all the lesions and not only one, that is what is happening, for example, with the biopsy. So we can analyze all the lesions and get the information in a whole body way, you know, we can say. So uh, in one hand, we build models based on the lesion. So that, that is what we call the lesion level models. So we evaluated and we extracted features from a lesion alone, and we created a model in order to predict if a specific lesion is going to grow or is going to shrink. But at the same time, of course, we can build patient level models. So uh, we can combine the information of all the lesions to create a patient signature to build an AI model for, for the prediction of the overall survival or the response to a treatment. So going for the model uh, at the lesion level, so as I said, the, our main target was to predict if a lesion is going to grow or is going to shrink. So for that, we had a database of 256 patients, but if we go to lesions, we had uh, more than 5,000 uh, single lesions. So the main objective was to predict if a, le a specific lesion was going to shrink or is going to uh, grow using uh, both only one scan at quite a baseline or combining the information not only of one scan, but also the first follow-up that we had of the patient. So this was, these were the results that we obtained in this study. So we built two different models, one to predict the, the shrinkage of a lesion, defined as a, a decrease of the volume of the lesion in a 40%. And we had another model to predict the growth of a lesion, so defined as the um, increase of the volume of the lesion in a 65%. And we obtained an area under the curve uh, for the shrinkage of 75% and for the growth in a 76%. So in this way, using uh, features extracted from the baseline CT scan, our model was able not to predict if a, a lesion was going to grow or shrink with an AUC of 75%. However, we also found that introducing information of the first follow-up, so including information not only one time point, but included an additional time point, the, this uh, area under the curve was increased. No? So, for example, the shrinkage was predicted with an area under the curve of 82% and the growth with an 85%.
Then, if we go to the model at the patient level, uh, what we wanted to predict is the best overall response, no? so the response to the treatment. In this way, we build a classification-based model uh, in order to differentiate responders from non-responders. So responders were defined as those with either complete or partial response and non-responders, those as a stable disease or progressive, uh, progressive disease. And we had one, uh, almost 120 patients per class. And building these models, we obtained an area under the curve in the test set of 78%. Now, so we were able to predict the response to the treatment in this set of patients with this uh, area under the curve in this case. So just to, to conclude, um, AI has shown great performance in lesion automatic segmentation, which allows on one hand the automatic evaluation of the response to the treatment, and on the other hand, the tumor characterization. At the same time, lesions can be characterized through imaging thanks to extraction of both uh, radiomics and the features and this alone, or combined with other patient information, because in these examples, we have focus on imaging. However, we can combine the imaging information with other tests that we have of the patient, for example, just demographic, clinical data, genetic information, that can be used to build these predictive or prognostic biomarkers. So AI models can be built both at the lesion, at the patient level, for a better disease characterization. No? So thanks to AI and radiomic features, together with other patient information, we can build this kind of predictive models. So not only going to what is happening today to the patient, but also what is going to happen no? in the future to the patient. And with that, I finish my, my presentation. And uh, with that, we finish the presentation part and we go to the Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Anna, Glenn, and Michael, for that very insightful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And now I will invite our uh, speakers to put on their webcam as we begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. And as a reminder to our, our audience that you still have time to send in your questions using that questions window, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the time that we have together. So let's start with this first question here. Uh, this looks like it's for you, Anna. This audience member is asking, what do you think is needed to implement the use of radiomics in routine clinical practice? Okay, so that's a very good question. No? So uh, today uh, we can say that um, there are already models no, that are implemented um, in the hospitals, but these are more related with the first type of models no, that I have commented. For example, the ones to analyze what is happening today to the patient. No? But we want to go as well to those that to predict what is going to happen to the patient. And for that, we are in a very early stages, we can say, and to be able to implement these kind of models in the clinical routine, the first thing that we have to do is to increase the evidence now that we have in these kind of models. And this is what we are working on now to create a lot of evidence in, in this way and a lot of external validation. Now. So not only developing models with my control data, but also to build models with additional data that comes from different institutions and different sites in order to externally validate these models. No? So this is more in the scientific part. And of course, no, it, it requires the integration and the adaptation no, of, the, of the experts in order to get used no, to these kind of models that I think are quite new and a lot of education no, needs to be done. And, and I think it's a, a lot to do, but I think it's, it's impressive no, can, what can we do in this way. Okay, thank you so much for that answer, Anna. Let's jump to our next question. Uh, this question is, oh, this audience member is asking, in which type of cancer do you foresee that there will be a major advance in immunotherapy in the coming years? Who would like to answer that one? I can answer that. Um, so I think based on uh, current studies that are ongoing and some early preliminary results uh, that have been reported in the last <clears throat> year, I think that one of the areas that uh, researchers and, and companies are trying to tackle is microsatellite uh, stable cancer. And so we have already knowledge that MSI high tumors 
in general have a high probability of responding to uh, immunotherapy. Uh, now, um, there's been a lot of focus on the majority of uh, tumor types, which are MSS or, um, or microsatellite stable. And there's been some early results of uh, one particular PD-1 in combination with a CTLA-4 antibody, which has shown some pretty nice results in colorectal cancer, where the uh, majority of these patients have MSS disease. And so uh, hopefully we'll see in the next uh, 12 months or so uh, data coming from phase two, phase three trials, which uh, validate this finding. And, and that would be a, another option for patients down the road. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Glenn. Let's jump to our next question here. We have time for, I think, two more. Uh, this question looks like it's for you, Michael. Uh, how long will it take for CD8 immunopet to become a reality in clinical practice? Uh, yeah, good question. I mm -hmm. think um, really what we need to do is to identify the, the clinical settings in which CD8 Immunopet has the potential to, to impact treatment decisions, and we have to generate good quality data in trials in order to show that uh, it, it really can do that. Um, I think realistically, an initial label would, would probably be quite narrow with potential to, to broadening uh, later on as more data is accumulated. But, uh, you know, I think um probably in the next two to five years we could we could see some initial use of cd8 pet in the clinic okay perfect thank you michael this looks like it's for you anna do you think there is much more to see in the field of artificial intelligence and medical imaging or do you believe we are only at the beginning of the road what is your prediction what do you think I think that there are not a lot of a lot of things no, to, to be done um, uh, well, in the future. No? So I think that we are just in the beginning of what we can obtain uh, from AI. So related now with the same things that I was saying, you know, there is a lot of room in order to be able to develop this kind of pretty biomarkers no, in order to um, stratify be better no, the, the patients uh, from the beginning, so to detect those that are more risk and those that are less risk, no, in order to uh, guide uh, better no, the therapy to this kind of, of patients. So I think that we are just in the beginning. No? So um, uh, if we take a look to the AI community, not only uh, on medicine and, and imaging, uh, probably most of the audience now have seen a great improvement uh, in the last months. No? And this is something that needs to be applied you know, to, to medicine as well. And of course, it's something that we will see uh, in the next time. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'm going to squeeze one last question in here before we have to close out the webinar. And it looks like this is for you, Michael. So the question is this audience member is asking, which are the main barriers for the implementation of CD8 immunopet? So I think one of the challenges we face is attracting patients to, to imaging studies uh, which don't have an immediate benefit uh, because at the moment a lot of the trials that are running, um, we don't use the CD8 PET scan to then make any changes to the, the patient's treatment management. Uh, and we also have a relatively long scan time of 60 minutes due to the, the low positron counts compared to some other short-lived radionuclides. So um, it's inconvenient for a patient to, to sit in a scanner for that long and, and sit still. So um, yeah, I think attracting patients to these studies is one of the biggest challenges we face. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for that answer, Michael. Well, thank you very much for all those answers. We have reached the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. That's our timer. <laughs> if we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at KeyBIM will follow up with you after this presentation. And if you have any further questions, please use the email address that you see there on your screen. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from XTalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. Additionally, there is a link to view the recording of this event, which can you can also share with your colleagues so they can register for the recording here as well.
A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. And KeyBIM is planning two more webinars, one near the end of this year, and the last one will be during the first quarter of 2024. So keep a lookout for more information as it becomes available. Now, please utilize the link that I'm going to send to you in your inbox right now. And if you look for further information for KeyBIM, this is a link that you should utilize to get to their website. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Michael, Glenn, and Anna, for that very insightful presentation and for answering all your questions. So thank you very much. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye, Glenn. Bye, Anna. Bye, Michael. Bye, everyone.